Who are the masters of the internet? Who rules the World Wide Web? That was the first question discussed at this 2015 conference, organized by the Serbian National Internet Domain Registry Foundation on 10th and 11th of March 2015 at the Metropole Palace Hotel in Belgrade. Leonid Todorov, General Manager at the Asia-Pacific Top-Level Domain Association, Jean-Jacques Sahel, Vice President at ICANN in Europe, and Martin Boyle, Senior Policy Advisor at Nominant UK, discussed specific aspects on the subject, including IP addresses and domains, who can get them and who makes all those decisions. Okay guys, um, maybe I'll, I'll start with Leonid and uh, th somehow the concluding part of Jacques's previous um, intro was that actually it's a database, it's nothing so serious, it's a technical driven, why do we matter? I mean, why are we discussing it here? Why, why those 300 people here shouldn't matter about it at all? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, welcome uh, to our panel, yes, of course, and I'm very happy to be here and I'm uh, most grateful to the, uh, 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 to the Renews leadership who made it possible for me to come because obviously Russia uh, lives, I mean, go, uh, went actually um, into uh, some uh, dire straits and it's not that easy for us any longer. Uh, but uh, just a very important correction, uh, uh, I'm no longer associated technically with this uh, cctld.ru, rather I'm general manager of that Asia Pacific uh, organization, which is Association of Top Level Domains in Asia Pacific region, which unites 40 uh, uh, national registries there, operators of uh, country code domains there. But I will be speaking in my uh, personal capacity because some things which I may say uh, could be sort of uh, not that. Uh, in line with uh, the mainstream, I would say, of the global discussion. So uh, this is my personal perspective on the things. Well, first of all, uh, for those of you who may have followed the discussion, the global discussion on IANA transition, it was a very interesting point which Jean-Jacques also touched upon. That was something like, uh, the bottom line was, you know, uh, the US government's role was very symbolic has been very symbolic. And we, as the US government, are now ready to give away this symbolic role. Now, my question, immediate question was, if that's so symbolic, why there is such a big fuss around this? Was it some uh, governments who were really keen to get it, uh, to grasp it from the, from the United States government, or uh, is there anything else? Then, uh, when we talk about the U.S. government's symbolic role, and Jean-Jacques, uh, again, touched upon that, why such an uh, ultimatum, as we would say in Russian and probably in Serbian, uh, if no U.S. government, then no any other government? So why the U.S. dictates this role to, um, uh, that, uh, uh, let's say, terms of the game, rules of the game to the global community, if their role was so symbolic? This is, I guess, very important because sometimes we are lost in uh, certain senses and nuances. Because when we uh, go back to the uh, uh, to the uh, to, to that uh, record of John Pastel, I mean I wasn't there, but uh, uh, the rumors were, I mean at least I was told so that initially John Pastel came up with a notebook, with a simple notebook, and that was Ayana. So he ticked off whatever changes in the root, uh, um, I mean in in in, in the file um, of the zone every time, and that was it. So very simple. And then natural questions would arise something like, what is being told about Tayana transition? Uh, that the process should be uh, very uh, well thought through, that it should engage all the stakeholders and all those things. Is it really the case? Shall we try some reality check? Like, for example, is it really a complex process? And my answer would be, no, it is not. Because back in the 90s, John Postel, actually, just by himself, made that transition manually. It was exactly January the 28th, 
1998, when John Postel sent out instructions to the root uh, server operators, uh, asking them to report to him rather than to a company which was at that time running Ayana. And they obeyed, except for another four servers which were run by the US government, military and NASA and whatever. So John Postel made it within a matter of minutes. And then he was asked to undo this. And he was asked very persistently, I'm sorry, uh, by, uh, by the U.S. government. And by the way, when we're told that ICANN is a fruit of the Clinton's administration vision, strategic vision, let's not forget that in two days after John Postel tried to privatize IANA, the U.S. government was in a rush to start that, I, I mean, launching that ICANN. Just in two days after that. So it's uh, interesting just to, uh, once again, to revisit uh, that history, to understand that sometimes truth is there, but it can be a little bit twisted, a little bit banded uh, uh, to the, for the benefit of certain parties. Now, uh, next thing uh, which I put for myself is that uh, we, what we can take from, uh, uh, from the presentation is that IANA is pretty much the U.S. government property, right? Well, in a sense. The U.S. government sponsored uh, the creation of, the, of IANA and development of IANA, but at the same time, we should not forget that the holder of intellectual property right to IANA is not the U.S. government. It's the University of Southern California. And nobody asks the University of Southern California whether they agree or not. You can check uh, when uh, ICANN uh, enters into contract with the U.S. government about IANA, there is a very special clause there, a special line, that the intellectual property right to IANA is actually held by the University of Southern California. So, again, a very tricky, like, evasive reality. And uh, there is yet another thing. Um, which is, uh, uh, well, I told about, uh, mm, uh, I, uh, well, uh, once again, IANA transition uh, is viewed as a kind of unique process. Uh, for the first time ever, uh, there is such, such an exercise. But in fact, uh, uh, IANA was transitioned several times. And I already mentioned John Postel, and uh, there was yet another company, uh, uh, Network uh, Solutions, I believe was it, uh, which uh, was for a while uh, a YANA operator. So, I mean, it is not new for us to understand that IANA was transitioned before. So again, the question is, so why this time we are so adamant uh, about this process? While it's discussed time and again, it's not my first conference, and I believe that many of you uh, have been remotely or in person at some events where that IANA transition was made the central uh, uh, topic to discuss. Let me, let me try to get back a little bit and, uh, and summarize where we are now. So as you said, um, IANA is actually a function, a technical function, right? that uh, helps update this database that Jean-Jacques sh showed on the, on the screen, which is actually linking domains with IP addresses, right? It's a technical, technical issue. On one hand, we have seen it, Leonid, you said, in the history that different entities have been doing this function, the IANA function, right? So it's not a big deal, it's a technical thing. Now what we are having um, is the change of the to whom Ayana is responsible. Jean-Jacques, if you want to jump in. Just maybe something that I, I should have explained uh, during the presentation, which is what, what exactly is this US oversight role for Ayana? So, for instance, you will have a new country being created. Recently, just as an example, we had South Sudan. Uh, the .ss country code, so that's that country code SS has been agreed in other international institutions, the International Standards Organization, ISO. The government of South Sudan effectively applied to the ICANN community to operate that new domain name, .ss. It went through all the right procedures, it was agreed. IANA, the, the people managing the, the IANA, the technical people, got everything ready. 
that we're about to update the database. Before they updated the database, I just contacted this NTIA, this US agency, and said, we're about to add .ss to be run by the government of South Sudan to the directory. We've followed all the procedures. Are you happy that we have followed the procedures appropriately? The US government would look at it and says, yes, you have followed the procedures appropriately. Please update the database. That's broadly the US government uh, role as it stands today. And before I, before I move to, to Martin, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick uh, reflection on that. Uh, the question that, that users following this are often asking is, so what happens if the US administration, for any reason, says no? So does it mean that South Sudan would not get, in spite of the procedures, because the ultimate authority is US, would not get a domain? What happens if the US decides to kick out Iran because of sanctions, which has never happened, by the way. This is interesting. The US have ne has never misused this position. We can discuss why. But is, that, is this influence of US actually, uh, can it influence the internet and the functioning of the internet? Now, let, let me uh, switch to, I'm just drawing this to the discussion. Yeah. Let me switch to Martin with a now brief initial reflections from your side. Uh, thanks. Um, I think my um, starting point is that, um, yes, the United States government has uh, always been seen to have quite a dominant role in quite a simple function. And for a lot of countries around the globe, that's quite threatening. I happen to come from a country where if something were to go wrong, uh, it would be quite easy for me to get the UK government to send its ambassador in and uh, to sort it out quickly. So I can, from that perspective, understand uh, the concerns that somebody might have uh, on the US government role. And as a net result, I actually see a very important step the step of moving it away from the US government in what, in terms of 1998, would have been privatization. And uh, in the jargon of today, and I really don't know how this comes over in Serbian, um, into the collective responsibility of the multi-stakeholder community, so that bringing that new level of accountability into the system. And that, I think, is an important step. Um, but part of that is that, uh, and here I think I would disagree with um, uh, Leonid's view, or at least as he expressed it, uh, I actually think that where the US has always been seen to dominate that process, it would certainly have seen its role as being to make sure that others did not. So in fact, uh, as you've just said, uh, .ss got put into the root. Nothing has ever been removed from the root. Um, because the US government actually knows that if it did, it would break the system. So that's actually sort of quite an important check and balance. And then I sort of go on to say, well, you know, let's actually go back to what Jean-Jacques said about uh, the IANA. The IANA is a simple database system. Very, very simple. Um, registries who are running um, TLDs have got, uh, you know, in our case, 10 million entries in our database, as opposed to uh, a few hundred, perhaps now uh, a, a, a bit over a thousand entries in the IANA database. It's a key service. It is primarily technical and clerical. And I would strongly say it needs to be kept there very much as a technical and clerical service. However, it has got that political shadow hanging over it that, in theory, the masters of IANA could pull the plug and .uk comes out of uh, the, uh, the internet. 
I actually think that would break the system, but you know, it, is a, it is a risk. And I'd come up with uh, saying my other big word, uh, other than the privatization process that we're now going through, is a non-politicization of the process. Whether it be politicization with the sort of government role of politicization, or whether it be a lowercase politicization where actually it is a particular dominant view. And I don't want to knock the multi-stakeholder model. It's not intended to knock the multi-stakeholder model. But for .UK, I would be very, very opposed at being told by um, a US pressure group that we have to adopt certain policies in UK. And if I feel that way, I'm pretty sure there are other countries around the globe that would feel even worse. And I'll stop there for the moment. Larry, quick uh, reaction. Yeah. May I ask the audience, uh, you drive the cars, of course. Uh, what is that uh, uh, inscription on these rear view, uh, uh, you know, glass? I mean, I don't know how it's called in English. Huh? Yeah, that, that rear view mirrors, you know? What's the inscription? I mean, what, what, what is the wording there? What does it say? Objects seem to be closer than they are in the reality. Right? So the same with the, internet, with the internet. It's such an evasive reality. Now, there was some absolutely correct remarks, except for who actually enters whatever changes into the root zone file. I mean, what's the entity which is doing that? Who is tasked to change that root? Yeah. Yeah, who? Um, well, uh, yeah, it's uh, VeriSign that does it under a separate contract from a US government. And I think one of the interesting things to note about VeriSign is that it runs the big daddy of all top level domains. Good. Dot com. Bigger than all of the others put together. Uh, so, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a big risk. So, we have a, yeah. currently, we have a US Sorry. company which uh, actually does a change. In, with the agreement of the U.S. government, is that right? That's yet, yet, yet another point. Now, who is eligible so far at this present stage uh, to enter into a IANA contract with the U.S. government? And the answer is one of those key qualifications is the supplier to the uh, where what to the Minister of Defense of the United States. And the one and only bidder for that IANA contract has so far been ICANN, right? So we should also bear this in mind. I mean, I'm happy about these things to change. I mean, that's fine. But that was the key, the key qualification. Now, my next question to the audience and to my fellow panelists is, when you run such an important, such a critical function, does it mean that you have no right to mistake, to make a mistake. I mean, if you have this uh, ultimate authority to decide whether such and such uh, change in the uh, um, uh, root zone file uh, should and must be done, does it mean that you have no right to make a mistake? Pretty what much so. What happens if there is a mistake? Let me, let me just tell you, because I have two vivid examples, which might be, uh, well, for you, might be kind of a new. .tm is a top-level domain for the Republic, a Republic of Turkmenistan, a very obscure uh, country some of you have never heard of. It was a part of the Soviet Union. And it's a very peculiar country. Uh, uh, suffice it to say, it's second to North Korea in terms of openness. Uh, .tm is supposed to be run by some Turkmen, uh, whatever entity. But you'd be surprised, it's run in the uh, United Kingdom by some British uh, company under some circumstances, which under some circumstances was delegated that right, was mandated to do that, 
and the government of Tur Turkmenistan has no idea whatsoever how that became possible. I mean, they talked to me very openly. They said, we never granted any letter of support to that organization, to the best of our knowledge. Let's uh, oh, sorry. For, no, no, it's, it's a great example, and there, there, I'm sure there are other examples. Um, there were a couple of good comments on the Twitter wall. Uh, one was that, uh, that uh, X-Files movie uh, music would f suit well in the background of this discussion. The other one is that, uh, unfortunately, we don't have any lady with us today at the panel, and I know, and we apologize for that. We've been trying our best, but it just didn't work this time. We promise next time, I hope we promise next time to have ladies as well at the panel. Um, then there was a question which was related to whether it's really only about the database or, I mean, the whole content of the internet and so on, and how important is that. We're not going to go into that part of discussion. Today we're discussing the root zone and the top-level domains. Of course, there is other aspects of the internet which are equally or more relevant, but currently we are discussing the US role uh, and, and what's happening. Now, before we move to the next question, which is, so what happens if we change? Uh, Martin, I'll give you, in a second, I'll give you a feedback. Any questions or comments from you? Okay, we'll, we'll follow the Twitter as well. Uh, any comments from your side? Any questions? Any unclear things? I definitely have to... Uh, <laughs> Um, I can't really tell you. <laughs> it's just because it's the local joke. <laughs> so you, you will not, I'll, I'll explain you later. Um, any comments, any questions? Or should we move on? I hope that doesn't mean that you're confused. Sure. Can we, can we get a mic there? Uh, please introduce yourself. Please. We can't be anonymous there. <laughs> To be shot or what? Uh, no, we don't have a Thank shooting you. squad. No, no. No? I'm disappointed. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Mikhail. I'm uh, a local boy. And I have a question for the whole three of you. Uh, you are talking about the t technical stuff, uh, how the US government uh, w wants to back down. But there is uh, another question that, uh, pop that pops up. Uh, why does the US government want to back up, want to yeah, back up, when the internet is a huge uh, database where you can look everything up. Uh, it can be used by the security services, uh, KGB, sorry, FSB, uh, NSA, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, why? Uh, you say the US government had a symbolic uh, gesture or something. I'm sorry, my voice is it's troubling. So why are they backing uh, down? Why? That's that's an excellent introduction in the next, into the next, uh, next part of the, of the session. Any other points, comments? There was a good question over there, which I'm just drawing also. What happens if the country doesn't exist anymore, as we had seen a couple of times in the history? So what happens, who decides, and so on? Any other question for the moment? We'll open up later as well. Okay, back to you. Uh, Martin wanted to comment something quickly, and then I'm uh, over to you, Jean. Martin. Um, yeah, I think um, I'd like to sort of come back just on the right to make a mistake. And I think the risks of making a mistake continue to increase. I think um, we have got to try and make sure that the risks of making a mistake are minimized. Um, the .tm uh, story, yes, I know the person who runs .tm. Uh, he tells me that it's under contract from uh, one of the ministries in Turkmenistan. I have no way of judging that whatsoever. And I would actually make the point that the IANA functions operator doesn't have the ability to judge who is the uh, authority that they should listen to uh, in Turkmenistan or in any of the other 190-something countries uh, in the globe. And, um, and when you then get to delegations and redelegations, which tend to be very, very bitter, um, you know, I can actually start really understanding, going back to the question we've just heard, why the US government would like to back away from something that it can take lots of blame for 
and it can probably have no influence on because, um, yes, go back to Cold War thinking, uh, yes, we could take people's domain, uh, domain names down, we could disrupt uh, uh, foreign powers, governmental communication networks, um, yes, you could, but you've actually probably disrupted your own in the process. So, lovely symbol, but actually, um, yeah, thank you, but thank you, but no thanks. Yeah. Um, I really want to react to the X-Files comment to just make it very, very clear that uh, if I look like an alien from the X-Files, it's not my choice. I would love to still have hair. <laughs> <laughs> It's both of us. Uh, yeah. no. uh, it's not if we're ready. Yeah. Um, no, I think on the US government role, you know, there, there can be all sorts of considerations. I think Martin makes a good point. I think what's interesting to look at is, you know, f from a, an institutional perspective, and then a US government or US way of thinking, they like things to be run without too much government influence generally. They don't like big government. That's the way to think about it. So. An innocent way of looking at it, which is what the white paper in 97 said, is we'll set up this structure and we'll keep an eye on it, and we'll keep a backstop on it to make sure that nothing goes wrong. But once it's mature enough, this, this whole new structure, then we'll, we'll back out, we'll leave, we'll let it be run by the actors of the internet. Uh, and I think that's, that's an interesting way of looking at it. And I think by now, this structure has been run for over 15 years. We've had a domain name system that has enabled, you know, when ICANN was created in 1998, we had 150 million users. Now we have close to 3 billion users. With the Internet of Things, depending on which predictions you hear, we could have 50 billion devices connected to the Internet. I mean, that might be a high figure, but never mind. What that means is over just 15 years, we've had this tremendous growth. And to enable that growth, you need a system, an underlying architecture, that is very scalable and that is very robust. You need to add many numbers very quickly, very many internet addresses. You need, to, you need to have enough space, if you will, for domain names that you can grow that much. And you need the whole system to be uh, coordinated at global level so that you, know, you don't have fragmentation, that you can find this whichever other computer you want that's connected to the internet anywhere else in the world. That's actually remarkable, just in 15 years, to have basically been able to bring this to almost half of the population of the world. It's pretty amazing. So I think we have a system that's matured well enough. So if you look at it from a structural perspective or an institutional perspective, it's working well. Why should there be, uh, well, there, there's basically no need for a government to keep an eye on it. Let the community run it. That's one way to look at it, and there's other, other aspects. Let me disagree. <laughs> Conspiracy-minded as I am, Leonid, you, you have a lot of thumbs up. Uh, yeah, from, absolutely, from Twitter, absolutely. Well, well, well. Still, uh, remember 1998. Some of you may remember that. That was a great time for the United States. No, uh, let's say, uh, no match for them in terms of uh, uh, that superpower status. And yes, obviously, Clinton's administration the best and the brightest, I know them very well, some of them in person. Uh, they were real, uh, really visionaries in many senses. And yes, for them it was quite obvious that uh, the government should uh, step back and let uh, some private company to run you know, the internet, to govern the internet, let's put it in such a way. So that's probably why I can. But at the same time, again, just a reminder, that idea uh, popped up exactly in two days after John Postel tried to privatize IANA. And I would imagine why, because John Postel was one of those hippie guys who did believe in uh, public good. And I think that he's got this is my speculation. He got absolutely infuriated when he realized that IANA, his baby, was actually commercialized. And the contract was between a commercial company and the United States government. That's probably what uh, uh, was underpinning his move. I mean, again, I'm speculating. Now, coming to our days, so what we see now, we see Obama administration, the, the Obama administration ready to uh, uh, give IANA away, right? 
And you, Jean-Jacques, uh, uh, suggest that this is a pretty pro-private uh, sector-led uh, uh, exercise. But judging the Obama administration, I must say that this is the most socialist government in the tw in, uh, I mean, over the last 100 years, uh, uh, let alone Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I wouldn't believe in Obama's move towards a free market and the private sector because his experience, his record was absolutely opposite. At the same time, we have Republicans who are hardcore marketeers, you know, they are pretty much pro-market, and they insist that IANA should stay on as a national asset for the, with and for the United States because they don't believe in goodwill of certain governments, and here I, I would agree with uh, the Republicans, certainly. But at the same time, we do understand that the pendulum uh, was going from that free market and less government towards uh, less free market and more government, which I hate. But this is the reality. So again, the question is, conspiracy minded, remember, might it be a smokescreen move to uh, sort of uh, uh, camouflage a certain thing which is going on behind the scene, which is that very signed contract with the United States government. Very sign makes all these changes into the uh, root zone file. Ayana simply uh, notarized this process. So let's give away Ayana. Let's make this scapegoat so, so, so that to keep everyone happy. But at the same time, still keep our iron fist and grasp onto the internet. Jean-Jacques, um, since, uh, since I'm anyhow passing it on you and in that, that direction, before you, before okay. you take the floor, just a quick comment, um, because I know you guys, you can go on with these discussions, which are great, but we have another two blocks. Um, we, we've been looking at the US uh, position thus far uh, from the view of what their power can be. Now let's look from their accountability position. So thus far, the US was also a control mechanism that everything works fine, that the procedures have been respected. Now what happens now, if there is no US from September on, there is no one actually who is above ICANN and IANA and who can say, guys, you're not doing a good, good job. Now, do we really have, you said there is a, a right level of maturity already. How does it look? How do you, what is the mechanism that exists if the US goes away that we can be confident win, with? I would start with Jean-Jacques and then moving to... Yeah. I mean, assure us that we can be confident. Oh, huh, <laughs> I'd love to. Uh, okay, just very quickly. John Postel was part of the team that worked... Mike. So John Postel was part of the team that worked on the white paper, etc. So I think it, it might not be all that bad. And, and, you know, I'm French. I can come up with lots of anti-American conspiracies, if you let me. Um, <laughs> but I don't, I don't think it's as black and white. Uh, you know, uh, and... and, and uh, you know, the maturation process that I mentioned is, I think, only one angle. It has many other considerations, including political considerations of all sorts. As for how politicians feel and the fact that they have um, uh, sometimes very conflicting ideologies and, and decisions, that's absolutely, you know. Um, so that's, we, we can come back on that. On accountability, I think what I, you know, in the process, of transitioning. So it was announced in March 2014. We started a consultation process at the end of March. And very quickly, we had a lot of people in the community, globally, anywhere in the world, that started saying, hold on, exactly what you've just said, Vlada. If the US government goes, I mean, we, we might think it's not right to have a government at the top of the pile, but at the same time, having the US government in charge just ensured us that if something went wrong, they could say, hold on, stop it there. So there was a parallel process that was created that we called Enhancing ICANN Accountability and Governance. That is basically designed to make sure that whatever mechanism will be created to replace the US government's supervision will have enough power to indeed stop any bad behavior. And that ICANN as an organization has got all the relevant structures and mechanisms so that that can happen. So what is, um, well, there's a specific working group that's looking at it now. It's, it's working really hard at this very moment. They're looking at what we already have in the structure and seeing whether it's sufficient. 
and in particular whether it's sufficient to avoid this notion of capture. So how can we make sure that no particular interest group, whether they are governments or businesses or groups of businesses or others, can basically over-influence the process uh, in the wrong direction? And how can we have a mechanism that will enable the global community to say, stop, this is wrong, and that we have all the right mechanisms to stop it. So that's going on now, and the hope is that this uh, track on accountability will conclude at the same tra time that the working group on the transition uh, concludes, so we have all the right mechanisms, uh, in not in place, but in mind, uh, in about six months' time, when, which is the target date for completion in September. So in September, we hope to have uh, very clear plans on how we transition and, whether, and, and how to make sure we have the right accountability mechanisms in place to, to, to have the right uh, checks and balances, as we call it in English, and I don't know how it translates in Serbian. Now, Martin, we, we actually do have a very complex system underneath ICON, with a lot of committees, with government advisory committee, with non-commercial constituencies, with commercial ones. There is a system which exists for years. Is that something that we can, that, that's reliable? Is that something that promises us that this is not going to go wrong? Is that something that helps us see that the thing can be actually done in, in the right way till September? <laughs> million dollar question, huh? Yeah, if I knew that, uh, I could go down to the local uh, bookmakers and put a lot of money on that and uh, be able to fund my retirement. Um, the system, as you say, yes, is very complex um, and uh, people refer to it as multi-stakeholder, uh, but because each stakeholder group sits in their own little room, uh, I must admit I always think of it very much more as multi-silo. Um, which in its own right, I think, does actually help um, because let's go back to what does the IANA function do? And the IANA function is one of those things in a chain that when it comes down to uh, the .uk registry or the .rs red registry or the .serb registry, that we have to deliver to our customers. And um, Len is not the only one who can do history. Um, uh, when I first started in the domain name space, uh, the bitterness between CCTLDs and ICANN uh, in 2003 was massive. And it was all because ICANN came along and tried to impose its model on all of the registries. And there are countries around the world, including the UK, where we turned around and said, no, we don't want to sign a contract with ICANN. Um, now, we've come a long, long way since then. Uh, and therefore, uh, I would sort of go back and say, you know, of the four principles that Jean-Jacques put up earlier, number three is meets the needs and expectations of the global customers and partners of the IANA services. And this is what the whole of that uh, ICANN, the whole of the domain name system does. It does a devolution down, and it's that devolution to... Um, in European Union terms, um, subsidiarity, bring it down as close as you can to make the decisions at the customer level in business practice, at the local stakeholder level, at a more political uh, description. And that, for me, is where it becomes really important. And that's why an event like this is so important because I would hope that RNIDS goes away from this uh, with uh, a better understanding of what the Serbian community want and expect and needs and that will then empower the Serbian registry's voice 
when it stands up in ICANN and says, we need to do, we need to achieve something. And that, from a CCTLD point of view, is very, very much in, uh, more important than, uh, and the number of times we will disagree with the GTLDs who don't understand. Acronyms, acronyms, acronyms. Sorry, explain the that. generic top level domains. Uh, sorry. That was, yeah, I, I, I get the first negative point. Um, the, uh, the dot coms of this world, where they don't understand uh, this responsibility to a national, to a local community, which is so fundamental to our lives and so important to the vibrancy of our local community. Thanks. So, Leonid, um, if, I understood, if I understood correctly, what we can hope for is that thus far, maybe, the U.S. had a, a chance to remove a country or a domain. Now, we are not talking only about countries. We are now talking about, what do you say, seven, eight hundred new top-level domains currently, and probably over 1,500 in, in near future, right? Uh, so, theoretically, the U.S. could have had a chance to, to do it before. Now, it might end up on all of us, if this model succeeds, that we can decide if we want to remove or not a domain. Is it, is it really likely? <sighs> I like this word, we. Jean-Jacques used that, and Martin used that, and now Vlada is, is using this. We? All we us. who? <laughs> Those people in the room, uh, do we represent us, the global, or a part of the global community, let's say the Serbian community? Are you sure about this? Let me tell you very briefly a story. Uh, Fadi Shehadi, the president of uh, ICANN, was doing a multi-stakeholder session on Ayana transition and invited to the podium representatives of us, stakeholders, one from business, one from civil society, one from national domains, one from uh, uh, commercial domains, and they were all uh, on the stage, uh, like four of them. And then all of a sudden, a very nice man, a Frenchman, obviously, a, a, a member of the ICANN board stood up, he was sitting democratically uh, in the audience, and he said, wait a second, this panel, multi-stakeholder panel, is not legitimate. And Fadi was, of course, a little bit embarrassed. How come? Yes, that man said. We don't have a representative of, uh, fr from the internet users. And then I literally applauded Fadi because he made it, I mean, uh, he find that way out. He said, but why shall we need a representative of the internet users community? We are all internet users in this room. See, again, things on the internet and in, in the internet governance area are a little bit uh, kind of different from different perspectives. So when we mean us and we, we should be absolutely clear on this. We are not representing the whole bunch of people who use the internet, whether businesses or civil society or whatever. So somehow, I'm sorry, I will be very quick, uh, that was that institutional aspect. I love institutional economics. So in the institutional economics, there is a term which is public good. The good is available for everyone, for the, ben for the benefit of everyone, uh, for free or for a miserable payment, like public TV, BBC in the in United Kingdom. It's public good. It's available to everyone. So you would agree that the internet, theoretically, is a public good, because it must be uh, made available to everyone. But what about the process of governing the internet? Who can govern the internet? Who are those we? Let's start with some very simple thing. To govern the internet, you got to know English, because without English, you cannot just go ahead and catch up with whatever literature and discussions, because everything is in English. Number two, I will be very quick. Number two, you got to be uh, educated enough to understand all these technical peculiarities and even acronyms. Number three, 
you got to have funding to travel around intensively so that to network, I mean, it's a paradox. We all live in the internet. It's our home, it's our business, it's uh, what we win our daily bread with. And yet, we got to travel intensively. Who could afford such travels to every part of the world? Very few of us. So even with these three factors, we should understand that this is what in the institutional eco economics called club good, which is a good available to a very, very narrow stratum, to, to those very few, you know, chosen. And those we uh, in the audience, uh, whether at the ICANN meeting or uh, at the IGF, they decide for the others. So my question is, how legitimate are we to decide for everyone? I'm, I'm sure that the US government is also internet user, so they are also part well, of Well, they us. are, and then they are uh, better off than many other nations. Okay, uh, 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 over to you, uh, Jean-Jacques, with a uh, few observations of the key words that I picked up from, from there. Uh, with this transition, we actually want to move towards um, showing Internet is a public good, uh, closer to the people, closer to the communities. And there are three words that I picked up. Representativeness, how can we really make sure the representativeness is there? Responsibilities, if something goes wrong. Um, and inclusiveness, how do we really make sure that we have inclusive people? Maybe these three words can be a message to the ICON process further. Uh, over to you. So uh, I'll pick up on, on the first and third one because they're related. So participation and inclusiveness. Uh, Actually, thanks, Leonid, because it's a great pitch. Because my long-term uh, goal for my particular role, the way that I'm going to make sure I, keep, I stay in a job, is actually to increase the participation of European stakeholders in ICANN. This is how I'm going to be judged. At the end of this year, if there's more European stakeholders, my boss will be happy with me. And that means you guys. And I have to be very, very clear, ICANN is not only open to anyone to participate, but it actively encourages more and more participation. So what I, I do uh, around Europe, which is the region I deal with, uh, and I'd be very happy to do it in Serbia, I hope that I'll get this opportunity to come back and do that, is go to the countries, go to communities like, like this audience, and explain, uh, like, a bit like I've done at the beginning, what is ICANN, what we do, and then I go into why it's relevant to you, depending on whether you're just an end user, or you're part of a civil society, or your business, etc., and why you should participate, and how you can participate. Uh, this is something that is very real, because it's, we know that the internet is increasingly global, and because of the historic way in which it's developed, it has been very much uh, initially dominated by Western uh, users and, and people got involved from the beginning that were from the West. It's just a reality of how it developed. Now that we're becoming more global, we want to make sure that we have a governance system which is representative of all the internet users around the world and that includes bringing uh, everyone into the discussions. So I'd love to come back and, and, and do that in more detail with you. I should just mention also that not only is it open, but you don't, you know, we have actually travel funding available for, uh, you know, for some people. Uh, 50 people. people. It's more than that. And it costs a lot of money. Yeah, 50 is still. That's and we, we try and do that. Um, we have more languages than the UN. I have one more, anyway. We have transcripts available. We have uh, remote participation. So everything's streamed on audio and video. You can go to the websites and check it out. You can completely participate remotely. I would actually challenge you to find a single international organization around the world that is as open as we are and that tries to help participation in so many different languages and from so many nations. Seriously, I would challenge you to find them because there's not that many I know of. And believe me, I've taken part in previous roles in other discussions. And yes, all the problems that Leonid has mentioned exist. Yes, it's easier if you speak one of the key languages, such as Russian, English, or, or uh, French. Um, well, depending on some negotiations, it's good to have Russian. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not good enough, I have to admit. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a particular setup. We try and always uh, improve, but I, I, will, yeah, I, I hope that I can take that up maybe with, with Lada and, and our NIDS and come back 
uh, here to Belgrade to, to inform you about how you can take part because we really would want to welcome more participation. There's a few of, of you in the room that have done that. I've seen a few fellows, etc. But yeah, it's very open and uh, please do participate. Really one, of, one of the thumbs up definitely for the process in ICANN, besides the committees and the whole structure, is actually the participation of people, including the openness, the transparency. And I think I have the impression that uh, other processes, including ITU, uh, have actually followed uh, the level of transparency and e-participation within the ICON processes and Internet Governance Forum. So that's, that's a great achievement. Now, Martin, a quick comment before we throw the last few comments from the audience and wrap up the session. Quick comment from your side, if you wish. I mean, uh, including, we discussed a good example of the UK involvement of stakeholders. So how can all these 300 people actually get involved into this? Yes, it's, um, I think, one of those many cases of one size is not going to fit all. Um, so, for example, um, Nominet in the UK tries to um, uh, stimulate a UK internet governance forum. We're lucky to get 100 people in, into a room. Yeah, it gives you some idea of, well, actually, yes, you've got a rich seam here. Um, it um, might not be representative, but your networks all then allow you to get that bigger engagement in the process. And at the end of the day, I think the important thing is to help people understand the issues, help people get engaged, uh, and um, make sure that the, the local voice is heard. Now, that is actually, um, and the particular point that Vlada was referring to, uh, is uh, engagement with intergovernmental organisations. Because trying to get involved in the ITU, uh, and Nominet is one of the very few um, top-level domains uh, that is a member of the ITU is very, very difficult for all the reasons that uh, Leonid has just outlined as being issues for, um, uh, for ICANN. We were actually very lucky that uh, the UK government, and both Jean-Jacques and I used to work for the UK government, has over the years cut and cut and cut uh, and now the UK government finds it actually very difficult to be able to Im uh, be involved in all the fora that the International Telecommunications Union, an intergovernmental organisation, um, uh, has. So what has it done? It's opened up, it uh, has a multi-stakeholder approach, uh, and stakeholders in the UK um, uh, can get involved in that process. Uh, and so, for example, uh, at the ITU's Plenipotentiary Conference, at the World Conference on International Telecommunications, uh, Nominet, me, um, have the pleasure, I think this might be the right word, uh, of being part of the conference as part of the UK delegation. So you can see that you've got different ways of trying to make sure uh, that the right voice is being heard, that people are making sure that the bottom-up model is very, very important, very, very key. And I would uh, add on that that even in Serbia, we have a number of people which are involved in all these processes uh, on their own, um, with their own affiliations, with RINITs, with the ministries, with uh, NGOs. So we do have actually a community which is working quite closely and having an impact. We can witness that. So we should probably get together more. Uh, two final comments from the audience, if there are so. Don't be shy. I eat the microphone. Samo kratko, pošto ste već bili. I tamo je bio još jedan u pozadini čini, mi se pa ćemo i njega kratko. Just a short question. Who does your security at ICANN? Who does the security of the files at ICANN? That would be all. Hvala. I tamo posljednje pitanje negde nazad je bilo. Samo se predstavite. Hello, my name is Miroslav Osvić. I tweeted the question. 
we talked about the internet, and the internet that we spoke about is about 2%. What happens with the deep net, the another eight, uh, 98% of the internet, where is NASA and global data? Well, um, thank you for that. Uh, we'll, we'll not address the deep web this time because it's more kind of a content part rather than addressing part. Um, but I think I'll, I'll leave it to you for the first, well, maybe even the third question, if you want quickly. Um, Jean-Jacques, Google. So the first security. one that was dot app, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's been a, this new program of, of uh, this program for new generic top level domain names. So there's things like dot global, dot guru that have arrived. And there were a number of companies that were interested in operating dot app. And basically, it goes through a process within ICANN to check whether the applicants are good, etc. If at the end of the process you still have at least two different applicants, then the way to uh, decide between them, if you will, is that they go to in a bidding process. And basically, Google felt that it was worth, I think, 25 million uh, dollars. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to win this bidding process against a number of others uh, involved. Uh, and, that's, and there's a few auctions that have happened for other names. So that's, it's, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Um, the second one is security? Yeah, on security. Uh, you were talking about protection of, of data within, within ICANN. So there's, there's different levels of, of protections. Um, um, I know you can't give me an uh, accurate answer. I just uh, want to know: Does the this process done by, by a government agency or a no. private firm? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We got it. Okay. I mean, it's uh, as far as I know, it's done. It's done by our own uh, our own people when it's for ICANN as a staff, if you will, then you have the wider component of, of um, you know, root zones, etc., which is done in association with root zone operators, and they have their own uh, security procedures and committees to discuss those security procedures. We, yeah. yeah, hopefully Thank you. that's... We have two more minutes, and I just want the final tweet, 140 characters from each one of you. Um, encourage people to get into that if you can. Um, I'll, I'll actually start from Leonid. That's very simple. IANA transition is very simple. We're dealing with the natural monopoly and it's good to break it up because that's the only way we can do. Uh, take Gazprom, for example. You know, it's very easy. Gazprom is pumping gas, so it shouldn't transport that gas. That's clear to everyone and you guys felt that victim of the southern stream. So, the same with ICANN. Break ICANN, get IANA aside with, I mean, through the community efforts, leave ICANN with some regulation and get that right supervisory board to see what is going on with those two structures. And that will be it, very simple. No need for whatever, uh, you know, sophisticated processes. That was almost a small blog, but fine. Uh, uh, jean I'll leave you for the end. I'll leave you okay. for the end. Uh, 140. Uh, I think the best I can say is uh, the new system has to be open, transparent, and accountable. And it has to be particularly uh, accountable in making sure, and it goes back to the thing we said earlier, uh, about making sure that it is always accurate. Because if it's not accurate, people will lose trust in the internet. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Jean-Jacques? Okay. Um, Time to just say the truth. In tr Russian, if you wish. No. Sure. I don't, how would you say the, the truth is out there in Russian? That's the, uh, the truth is out there, the X-Files. The X-Files. Yeah. Uh, so that's not the one. No, this is the Lord of the Internet. That's a different movie now. Today. <laughs> the, the, there is the truth online somewhere. Um, okay, so the Internet is global, and the Internet is ours as users. Over this, the course of this year, we are supposed to transition to a model where the basic functioning of the internet is going to really come into our hands. You have the opportunity to participate both this year and in the future, so please get involved. Thank you. And look at this gesture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jean-Jacques. Thank you all. <laughs>